This is the Storied Outdoors, a podcast somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark, finding clarity in the stories we tell and the adventures that shape us. Welcome to the Storied Outdoors. My name is Brian, and I am uh, joined by my co-host, as always, my good buddy, my pal, Brad Hill. And uh, today we have a special guest, author, uh, S.D. Smith, uh, he goes by S.D. in his writings. We're going to call him Sam today. Um, he is the author of the Green Ember series, a million selling adventure saga featuring heroic rabbits with swords. Uh, my children love these books. And um, the uh, the Green Ember uh, is not only just in print, but it's been it's spent over. Uh, it spent some time as the number one best selling audio book in the world on Audi- Audible. Uh, he's got a new novel that he co-authored with his 16-year-old son. It's a thrilling fantasy called Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key. Uh, Sam's stories are captivating, and uh, you know uh, people all across the globe are reading them. Um, I, I met Sam in uh, in Hutchmoot. I actually started following him a couple of months before that because I was looking for books for my my son. And um, and for my children that were that were wholesome books that were um, faith based ad- adventure books, not just something that would be uh, uh, run of the mill. I wanted something deeper, and I found Sam at, on online, and, and I just started following him. Then lo and behold, I met him at Hutchmoot, and uh, you know Sam not only writes books, he's the founder and owner of Story Warren, a publishing events. Uh, an IP development house based in rural West Virginia. Um, Sam lives in Grandview, West Virginia with his wife and his four kids. So uh, that's the formal introduction. I want to get into how I actually, you know, my, my real introduction to Sam is (laughs) I've sat in his, um, in one of his sessions at, uh, at Hutchmoot, and it was on writing, and we started talking about this little book called Leaf by Neagle, and um, by J.R.R. Tolkien, and that book uh, has since really uh, impacted my life. But I had a, uh, Sam was making a conversation, I mean, a, a comment in his talk about how if God is prompting you to publish something or to write something or to do something creative, and you're not doing it, it's pride that's keeping you from doing it. Because you're saying that you know better than God, and I and I went up to him afterwards. I said, "Sam, I, it's not. I don't feel like it's pride. It's fear. Like I'm I'm afraid to get it out into the world." And he looked me dead in the eye and said, "Well, that fear comes from pride." And I said, "Okay, well, I'll get on writing that uh, proposal." And uh, you know, not <laughs> not long after that, I wrote a proposal to get a book published, and uh, you know, I was rejected. But it was still it was it was getting it out there that was I felt like being obedient. And that book later became a self-published book. And also talked to Sam about publishing. He said, oh, publishing, that's not the hard part. Just get the thing, write the thing. There's plenty of ways to get something published. So that's my introduction to Sam. Appreciate your impact in my life over the last few years and my children's life. I've got your book right here. Uh, You inscribed it in the beginning. It says to Charles and Perry, it is what it is, but it is not what it shall be. So Sam. Thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> I'm starting to get kind of scared with all those stories because I, I don't, um, I'm not, I don't, I didn't remember what we talked. I mean, I remember what that talk was about at the at the, that conference. I didn't remember. Uh, I remember saying something about like Tolkien can't write like me. I think that was maybe my. Yeah, I wrote that down too. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of pride, uh, I think that was. Uh, <laughs> I should have gone into that with a little more fear, probably fear, fear and trembling for, for saying that. But I, I do, I do remember, I do remember that um, talk. I think Lanier talked about Leaf by Niggle because she's smart enough to understand it. Um, <laughs> but I, and I, I think I was like, 
gave my little sort of hillbilly uh, slight on that one uh, a little bit and tried to just like set her up, I guess, you know, I was like the opening act. I was kind of warming people up and I think she, she <laughs> delivered. The, she's, she's brilliant. Lanier she's, is a, she was, is, that was, that was a, that was a great duo. You guys, y'all did a great job together. Thank you. That's uh, I like, uh, there's something I've seen several times, like in bios and you know, I think on your website, this idea of, of new stories with an old soul. I love that. And uh, also, I mean, we, we've spent times with, uh, with James Whitmer is a, a, a former guest of our podcast and turned into one of our friends over the past couple of years. And I know he works with you guys at story war and we love James and the work that he does. Yeah. He's a good egg. Oh, old James. Love that. Yeah. guy. He's a, a wonderful fella. And uh, yeah, new stories in the old soul. Yeah, I like that. I I I made that with my bare hands. I mean, there you go. Very proud of that. Um, well done. Uh, very proud and humbled by, about that. <laughs> <laughs> what uh? How did you? How do you get to that point? I mean, all joking aside, new stories with an old soul. Like when you're writing, two things. How did you? get to where you want to write new stories with an old soul and, and writing in general, what was your introduction into really going, I think I want to be a writer. Hmm. Well, that's kind of a long story. The, the, uh, I think started when I was a little kid, I think I was just fascinated by, by stories and my mom would read us books. And then I had a teacher and particularly in first grade who read us some books she read it. And, and one that stood out to me was uh, she read little women to us and little women had uh, joe march who was a writer and and for some reason that clicked with me as a as a like oh that's a possibility or something i, I think i thought of um you know i lived it, what, honestly like way up in the woods in a holler like uh, we lived in a bit in the basement of a um, log cabin that my dad was building um that he actually never finished we went to the mission field before that was finished but we lived you know, we would say so far back in the woods that nobody lived behind us. That's what my dad said. And when I was <laughs> when I was a little kid, I thought that was true, which was like kind of, kind of cool and sci-fi too. I was like, oh man, that's that's neat. Like really? Like if I kept going back there, but I <laughs> I went very far back in the woods. I never ever saw anybody. So, um, uh, so so that was my imagination was really piqued by by Joe March, and I thought, well, for some reason, I thought like, oh, I guess I'd thought about authors or that kind of thing as being like far away or British or from the you know from a just a, I don't know didn't feel like such, <laughs> yeah, but 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 Joe March was an American, and I thought, oh, or, and then Louisa May Alcott, of course, was an American, and I found out that that connection, so I really I fell in love with that idea, and I started writing little stories. When I was a kid, the funny thing is, I didn't really read that much. Uh, I mean, on my own, I didn't do independent reading. I didn't. There, there weren't a lot of boys that were doing reading. A lot of peers, boys or men, that I saw like reading very much. It seemed like that was something. So it just culturally, it was a little, little. Um, took me a while to catch up and and to really get into reading. I was a teenager when I when I um, got a hold of Ender's Game, but that 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 uh, and that just turned me into a reader. I went from there to to Tolkien and. Shakespeare and I just had it really changed my life I just sort of started making up for lost time pretty quick um but I, I wasn't your typical like just sitting around reading all the time kid um mm. I, but I always loved stories and I was sort of, sort of feel like I was haunted by the vocation of a storyteller uh, growing up but um yeah so so I I I but at some point, I think it started kind of clicking in later, much later in life. I really got serious. About it. I was probably in my thirties before I got actually pretty serious about um, writing. I wrote my first novel, and uh, but the but the but my my sort of public books, the the, the Green Ember series, they came out of stories that I told my kids. So it was a, a very um, not calculated. So you're talking about like, well, how do you come up with like new stories of an old soul? New stories of an old soul is something that I sort of uh, looked at what I was doing and was trying to describe it. You know, I was trying to describe it because we were sharing that with the, um, with the world. We were sharing these stories that it started out on my porch with my daughter. Um, and, and, and then with my son too, my kids, I would tell the story in this sort of serial form, all, you know, bedtimes on walks all around our property. 
uh, in the outdoors. And, and, uh, I would tell, so that became this sort of like our family story. And then, then when, when I went to write it, when we wrote it, write it down, and then we decided to share it, that, that was the first time, you know, I think about it as creation and connection now. Um, but uh, you know, you've got, you've got the thing that you're making and then, then how do you share it with other people? And mm. you know, that's uh, people to call, talk about self-promotion or marketing or all those kinds of things. I think of it as creation and connection. And, um, and, and a lot of the same principles I think apply in both um, removing obstacles, generosity, love, service, these kind of things, try to think of those things. Um, but uh, that meant like we were going to do a Kickstarter. So that meant making a video and making a video means like, I have to now think about what is this? Like, cause you know, it's so, it's such a nice uh, idea to just like, leave it. Well, it is what it is. You know, we want to know what it is, read it. You know, like the, uh, I think uh, when um, T.S. Eliot was, was reading, we did a, did a reading of the wasteland. And uh, when he was done, someone raised a hand and said, but can you explain what it means? And he just started at the beginning again and read it again, read the whole thing again. That was his, that's what we want to be. You know, I think as, as storytellers, we want to just like, well, you just, you understand it. I will just make it because I'm a creative and, you know, I'm so brilliant. And, uh, but, but the truth is we got to, we got to figure out ways to, to make connections, I think, and, and to share, be generous when we're sharing it with people too. So uh, I just was, I think we were making the video and I was trying to, and I was trying to describe what it was. What, uh, what is this? Like what, what's, what's different about it? What's unique or whatever. And um, I think I said it was, there were fresh stories with an old soul and that, that became, Oh, wait, they're really, they're new stories with an old soul. And that's, I think that's honest. I think that's what they are. I think that's how, that's how they feel to, to the readers. And I think naming that is helpful. It's helpful for the connection part. Um, but I think that's, that's an honest thing uh, that that's, that's what the, the, that is even or even then the early feedback that um that's what people i think are experiencing um one one uh my illustrator uh for the for the green river series Jack, uh, zach franzen is just a brilliant guy and he described he, he was we were talking about you know in those early days the green river sort, sort of started taking off and and we it was very surprising and kind of like we don't know what's going on here and i was kind of it was, it was a little bit of a uh, uh it was a little bit of like whiplash kind of like we didn't expect it to do what it, what happened. There was just a lot more other families kind of like us that, that enjoyed those kinds of stories. And we just, we weren't, we didn't know what we were doing. So he was trying to sort of explain it. And he, he, he explained it as in like the publishers aren't publishing a lot of books with those sort of old um, virtues and that kind of thing. So that he felt like those, those virtues themselves were sort of like uh, trapped in amber or they're like museum pieces that if you want like the stuff about little women or, or um, Anne of Green Gables or these kinds of stories, like they're, they're kind of old, they belong to the past and sort of the virtues associated with them, the moral imagination associated with them kind of belong to the past. And he said that, that with the green ember, it felt like, I think the readers were experiencing like all those things, but out in the wild, like not in a museum anymore, but like, present like kind of like a jurassic park kind of a thing like oh this thing's supposed to be in the past but it's it's here now and that's like a uh arresting in a hope in a good way and i think that's probably true that's i think that's true i think that's what's happened with people i think people that's been there, there's such a hunger for those kinds of stories and i think i don't i don't know that the green number series is the greatest series of all time I'm pretty sure it's not uh but uh but i think it does has fed that hunger that people have for this um oh new stories with an old soul i love that what yeah. is it about storytelling in general that you're drawn to i like uh i think i don't know i i, I thought that was just cool from the very beginning uh, so th there's a there's an element of where i just i like the I, it's fun uh it's hard it's it's one of the i don't know i think it's almost like it's almost like sports. Like uh, I, I love, always love playing. That's what I did most of the time growing up as a kid. And I, was, I still love sports. And uh, so, first of all, I think it's just really enjoyable. <laughs> and the, another thing that I have in common with those two things is I love the sort of self forgetfulness in it. And that might be funny to sort of for some people to hear who who don't do it, but um, who think of like, oh well, you got your name on the cover and you're a big deal and you're famous and or, or as a friend of mine said, fame-ish, which I think is more true. So. <laughs> um, 
when you're you're famous for writing books, you're you're not very famous. Uh, that's uh, a household famous. bestseller. <laughs> but uh, I love the but you know the it's it, it is really when, when you're it's like like you're reading you know when when you're when you're t- writing stories. I love the I love the fact that you can get lost in it and for hours an hour however long you've got like you can really you can really forget about yourself and you can kind of get if you're sort of an anxious introverted person too which i tend to be that way um it's a it's a real relief to 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 sort of forget about yourself for a while and just get lost in a story and i love that and i love the whole the clarity of it for me the the particularly the way that my career has gone that these were stories that were intended for my kids they were intended to be a gift that I never, I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking about the market. I wasn't thinking, cal- calculating. I wasn't thinking what is, what is, what do people want right now? Or what, are, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't, mm-hmm. it was so pure and so clear. And I wrote exactly what I wanted to write as a gift for my kids. And if, if it didn't sell anything at all, I was, I mean, I probably would have been disappointing, but I thought I want, we've got this monument, this, this little, this relic of our time together. And when I'm gone, you'll still be able to share that. You can share this with your kids. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, and I was like, that's a win right there. So I, I, I love the fact that the, 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 my experience with um, the book being somewhat successful is that it, that was just an extension of that. So I never had to, I haven't had to worry like to, you know, my, about my mission or anything. I have a real clarity about, Oh, I'm just, I'm writing these things for people that I love that I want to serve. that I want to give a gift to. And we got kind of a, um, a, a nice connection and a nice bond. And, and I feel like I, I just love the clarity. I love the, I love having the vocation personally of, waking up and having a job where I'm like loving kids, where I'm like trying to bless kids and give them a gift and something that I enjoy. So I, it's, and I think storytelling is a miracle. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible that you can share something from your mind, from your own soul, from your own family. And you can give that, you can put it down in little symbols on a, on a glowing screen. And then that can be printed in these, um, things that people have been enjoying for, for a long time in our history. And these, these little, this little package um, that's sort of in the, in the scope of mankind of kind of a new invention, but it feels very old fashioned too now. Uh, and uh, it's a little miracles. I, I love these uh, sharing them. It's uh, and they, they, you know, someone in Africa or the furthest part of the world, which I've, I've gotten letters from kids all over the world and, you know, they can, they can um, be seeing the things in their mind that I, that I saw and that I shared with my kids. So it's, I love storytelling. It's, it is, it feels like a way to participate in a, in a little, uh, a little bit of magic. Wow, yeah. What a gift. You mentioned earlier that you guys, uh, your family went on the mission field. Where did, where did you guys go on the mission field? We were in South Africa um, and a little bit in Zimbabwe, but mostly in s- Southern Africa for, most of my teenage years, I turned, uh, I was 12 years old when we went, I turned 13 in South Africa the day Nelson Mandela was released from prison. That was wow. my first uh, birthday. And when I left, he was the president. So it was That's a, incredible. It was an interesting time to be there for sure. Certainly. Yeah. I have a friend that, uh, that just, uh, his family just moved to Joburg and, and are, okay. are, are working there and hoping, cool. hoping to go visit him and encourage and love on him this year. Awesome. That's great. Let's yeah, I've back. been there one other time en route to Kenya when I was working for World Changers. We stopped in Johannesburg. It's one of my, my favorite uh, stories about going to Africa. I, you know, I grew up in a small town in Alabama. And so when I thought I was going to Africa, you know, I had all these presuppositions about what that meant. Yeah. And so we landed with a day layover in Johannesburg. We stay in a hotel. We're like, well, let's run and get something to eat. We go to a McDonald's. I get the same thing I've always gotten from McDonald's. And Diamond Rio was playing on the radio. I'm like, <laughs> we're supposed to be in Africa right now. What's happening? Because <laughs> this is not what I thought I was coming to see. So, you know, I just didn't really dawn on me just how westernized and how, you know, Johannesburg was such a, you know, a huge city. And so I had so many things in my head about what I was going to see. And it was not that at all. Yeah. No, it certainly got that way it. when we got to Kenya, but yeah, initially you can see those like, things in South Africa too. But it's sure. but you get, it's like the world, and they've got everything there from from the from the bush and jungle to the desert to 
mountains and oceans yeah. and, and cities and small towns and villages and tribes and they've kind of they've got it all there uh, but yeah Joburg's, Joburg's a big it, old big old city it really is it was but it was just a funny memory for me I was thinking oh man I'm going to you know Lion King Africa you know <laughs> yeah like a uh, two cheeseburgers large fry and large coke <laughs> <laughs> so uh what uh what part uh this would be a uh, what part did those experiences play and what part does, does the outdoors play in your writing? You know, as you're writing a story like the, the green Ember series, you know, what, what part does the outdoors and your experiences, you know, hiking or whatever in, how does that inform your writing? I, I don't know if I know exactly. Um, but it, you know, I know I've not I've never been asked that before, so I don't, I've never th- thought about that very much. But I, I, you know, the media thing comes to mind is that I, I, um, I take walks, you know, and and uh, that feels like a prescription for me, you know, for for uh, for health is is um, not only the movement but the sunlight and the and and um, just the beauty of of seeing. Feel blessed to be able to live in a place that is beautiful and uh it's not a it's you know it's funny i think with the with the pandemic stuff and people feeling you know locked down and work from home and that kind of stuff i think a lot more people are aware of uh, sort of the, the the power and privilege of, of living in a place that has beautiful outdoors and accessible that, that there are some downsides to living in big cities that are that um you know that that sometimes I heard a guy at a at a writing conference that um, down here in West Virginia. This guy um, convenes this incredible conference called Hope Words, um, and he, he's he, he's he was talking about. He said, uh, you know, our 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 back door, you know, out, outside our backyard is um, many people's dream. I mean, he was just talking about the sort of the uh, the surprising uh, beauty and um sort of people don't think of it anybody as having like an advantage for living in West Virginia but he's like we you know we we live in a place that's that's like a playground for 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 a lot of people who live in a big city so i love it here i love west virginia we live pretty close to actually what's now a national park it's the newest national park and um we we uh it was just a state park till pretty recently but um we walk i walk up to that and i live in a place called grand view and there's a beautiful overlook there and there's a uh, hiking kind of trails and it's, uh, there's an outdoor theater there with the plays and um, there's just, it's a beautiful place and uh, that's close by, but uh, you know, just walking, you know, just almost anywhere you look, it's just, there's, there's beauty everywhere around here. So f- related to writing, I think it's funny. I don't, I don't think about it very actively because it's kind of one of those things like I just sort of assume it's just it's there all the time for me. I love it. I love West Virginia. My families were very, um, we're sort of a little bit nutty about, you know, I think, you know, West Virginians get a little bit of a, I think this probably happens with Alabama too, but we get a little bit of a chip on our shoulders about like people making fun of us or overlooking us, you know, no, nobody. Um, it, so we, we've got a little bit of a, like, okay, ma- you know, make fun of us, but we're, we're very proud of who we are, you know, who we are and w- what we can be. But the truth is we got lots of challenges uh, in our state, but, but there's a lot of, a lot of um, good gifts too, but I love it. And I think just directly to, to storytelling is uh, in my writing is I, I love to take walks and actually my son and I, for this new book that we, this new series, uh, Jack Zulu series, um, we, we, we would write, we walk and, talk a lot about the about the storytelling so mm. about what, you know what's coming next that kind of thing and we would we would sort of figure it out we kind of like wrote the story like in our heads i guess um plotted out the story um outside and mm. we do that all the time and actually i do that with the green ember stuff to myself and and really in the last several years he's really helped me a lot he, he will take a walk and he'll help me like if i'm in a in a, in a tough spot if i can't figure out what to do next or what comes next i'll often just take a walk myself and be thinking about it, figure helping that helps sort of figure things out. 
and then um, often he'll help me um, with that as well. He's just got he's got really good story instincts, and he's it's been awesome to work with him. But yeah, a lot of our work happens outside. <laughs> um, that that's it's it's kind of the office in a way, and it just the 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 importance for people who are storytellers or people who are in the creative fields who are sitting on um, backsides in chairs for long periods of time. You know, you got to move. You got to move, and and if you if if all you've got is somewhere indoor to go, that's great. Uh, that's good. That's a good start. But if you can combine that with fresh breeze and sunshine and, and mountains and trees, then then uh, I, that feels like a I, I feels like an unfair advantage. So I, I I guess I think if people think of I I I'm, in many ways it would be there is a story to be told to say oh you're a you're a writer in West Virginia where you don't have a lot of peers. It's not like Nashville or L.A. or New York where there's just writers everywhere and all kinds of creative people. So you're isolated and that's really tough. You've had a, and I, yeah, there's a story to be told about that. But I like the story of where I've got um, incredible beauty right at hand and and um, that, that, I, that this is an unfair advantage for me that living in living in a rural uh, place, the county. Um you know, that's, you said rural West Virginia earlier, and uh, that's that's like West Virginia, and it's just, that's the same. Right. You can <laughs> you can say rural or you can say West Virginia. It's the same thing. It's all rural. It's redundant. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but I think of it. Hey, that's an advantage. I, I, I love it. That's a gift, and and that's that's, that's, cool. how, I, that's how I approach it. We, well, you, um, you know, you're touching on this this writing process, walking in the woods. You know, I love that that you know Lewis and Tolkien did that. You know, they took these long walks, and and especially. Yep. Uh, you know, some of them were together. Um, your writing process, uh, there's a little little house on your property called the Forge. And I'm so jealous of that. I'm, I'm not I mean, I'm not even going to be ashamed of it. I, I, I'm jealous that you have the Forge. Uh, can you tell us about your writing process and and that house and just a little bit of a little bit of what goes into the day uh, in the life of, of Sam Smith in the writing world? Well, you know, house is a very grand term. Um, it's not much more than what you can see on this video screen. It's it's a uh, it's a shed. It is a garden shed, and that that's that's what it was when we. Are, are you in there now? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, this is this is the forge. It's 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 tiny. It's really small. I do. I love it. It's great. Um, it's right. It's about ten feet. From my house, so my commute sometimes gets a little rough, in, you know. But uh, <laughs> I, do, I do my best to get here on time. But uh, yeah, it's not it's not far far from the house. And yeah, when we when we bought this house, it was uh, it was just like a garden shed and had all the tool, a bunch of tools and stuff in it. And it's uh, it's great. I love it. It's a it's a wonderful little place. Um, uh, I, uh, I it's it's kind of like a little well, a little white house got a little porch on it and. The, my favorite feature of the forge so it's called the forge because of because uh, that's you know that's where smith works and uh, so smith goes to work in the forge i can't try to think of it I as like, like that um i kind of I, I try to think of my job as being um pretty i don't know they're, they're, i believe all that stuff i said about sort of writing and storytelling being magical like this miraculous kind of thing but i also believe that it's a that it's an ordinary Christian vocation rooted in love and service. Mm -hmm. And so that I, I feel like it's a job where, where I should wear an apron, you know, that it's a job where I'm serving, I'm serving food, you know, to kids, I'm doing something. I feel that's, I'm a line cook. I'm, I, I, so I kind of think of it as like a job I, and I, I don't want to divorce it from sort of the romance element of it. I want to kind of hold on to both of those things at the same time. Um, but that, that apron wearing blacksmith, you know, sort of show up to your job kind of thing, uh, I think helps deal with some of the sort of the, the temptations to pretension, the temptations to um, to, to uh, elitism or all that kind of stuff, which I think is pretty easy to see. And if you talk to very many um, people in the arts, I think that's that's some of the stories we tell, which are not exactly, I don't know, they don't feel very consistent with sort of the kingdom of God uh, approach. Um but I love, so I love it. It's like a little modest little, um, little shed that I get to work in every day. And I, and I love that. My, probably my favorite feature of it is that I've got some stone, like a little stone wall 
just a small one around the outside. And that started because my neighbors, um, they were uh, getting older. And um, I think uh, the, the um, they were almost like grandparents to us, but we kind of helped take care of them. And they were, they were, they were wonderful people. And he was getting close to, to dying and she was just trying to deal with stuff. And they had a bunch of stones from uh, their various trips, like to different, they'd love to go down to the river and they would bring stones back and they'd kind of put them in different parts of their yard, kind of little um, around bushes or this or that. And it actually made it harder for them to, to mow and stuff. So she needed to get rid of them. So I went and got them all. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Gina was gone. My wife was gone uh, at the time. So I had all these rocks and I just dumped them in the, in the yard. I was like, I don't know what to do with these. And it's going to be such a pain. And, um, but I was just trying to help her and they were really precious to her. And, you know, it was like, she was, um, getting, uh, older and very sentimental. And so this was like, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, they're from the depression era too. So like, they did not want to, I mean, everything, every time they do a yard sale or anything, it would be like, they couldn't get rid of anything because they valued everything so high, you know, it wasn't quite like the hoarders kind of a thing, but it was sort of, you know, that generation. And, and honestly people in, poorer places you know got a lot of you got a lot of ancestral memory of like of uh, not just letting things go so anyway these were very precious to her so i didn't know what to do with them so i had them in my yard and then i just i just one day I was like hey well i think i'll i think i'll just stick these around so i've sort of made a little wall around and they're they're not designed for it. they're not flat rock it's not easy it's not good so it was hard so i made that kind of a thing and i made a little ring around the forge and um gina is like a green thumb so she was making like kind of a little garden in between so there's like a little little bit of a garden um with kind of ground cover and different things in in inside of that and then i, I really like that idea so i started getting um stones from my like my childhood home where my uh, where i grew up my my uh my papa's house i got some stones from there and i got some from his dad's house i got some from gina's um grandfather's home, old home place and uh and uh i and a few other stones from sort of like mem places of memory like so so i mm. feel like i'm surrounded sort of like by ancestors out there that's it's oh. not it's not the prettiest wall in the world because some of the are from some of them are from virginia and some of them are from you know different places so they're, they're kind of weird and don't match but to me i kind of like that because that's how i feel like a little bit of a misfit or whatever it's so i've got this sort of a these little stones of memory not like a like a witch or something, but <laughs> it's not like that. Not those kind of stones, but it's a, I feel like they're connected to sort of um, our, my past and, and my community where I am now and what other people value. So that's a, like a little ground feature that I walk through every day um, that reminds me sort of of um, where I come from. It's kind well, of biblical there. Well, Ebene well, Ebenezer's man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that man yeah, so much. Yeah. A little bit of that, just a little bit of memory. Yeah. Stones, stones of memory. Well, that's great. Mm. I love, yeah, I do love that. I, the, the older I get, the more I appreciate things like that, that, that help me remember and tangible things like that. And to have a sort of a cloud of witnesses watching you as you, uh, as you write and create. So to have that memory and that's rich, brings the richness to your stories. Uh, you, you talked about walking with your son and uh, this, this newest project, uh, Jack Zulu and the, uh, the Waylanders key. A um, couple of things. Uh, one, as a dad, to to have your son enter into the work that you do, what was what was that like for you as a dad to to have him come into what you do and to share that craft with him? Uh, a huge honor. Uh, I I loved it. Um, it's a, a privilege. It's like an answer to prayer for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that we were able. We, that we were able to do one book and we're working on the second one now. And it's a real delight and joy. I, I would love to be able to say that we've, you know, had all kinds of, I, I was a little bit concerned because we had kind of a pretty good relationship. Um, we've had a good relationship and, and uh, I was kind of worried like, Oh, this is, this is, I, I know how much pressure I feel it just through mm. the publishing process. It's like, you know, we're a small little guerrilla warfare, um, little, <laughs> um, uh, crew and so just just uh how much pressure there is to do so many different things to kind of make it happen so but uh, uh so i was concerned that this one might put a strain on our relationship that would be really tough but he's been so this was really a lot of his ideas to begin with this was kind of his story and so it kind of became our story 
um, together, but um, he's been so uh, such a privilege to to work with a real like I don't know I guess I feel like people would say that, but it's really true. And we had very minimal, almost to no sort of like significant conflict about it. He's he's had a real he has a real approach of, which is a real professional approach. I think that's that would not have been true of me. I don't think at that age, but he had a real like um, best idea wins kind of a thing, and so he's just ready to. The humility there that that surprises me a little bit. Um, just considering like how proud I think I could be at his age, um, and more focused on like what what's what am I getting here instead of like what's the, he's really he's really taken to heart this approach of like trying to serve the audience well and serve the the story really well and try to so I, it's been an absolute privilege. We've spent a lot of time together. I'm impressed with him. I'm pleased with him. I'm so I'm delighted with him. I love the story. I think we, what we what we've done together is really fun. I think it's it's good. I think there's uh, much better than something I could have done on my own. Uh, but I think more than anything, I'm just proud of him as a as a dad that he's sort of taken. He's just worked really hard. He's worked very very hard. Uh, had a had a uh, really good work ethic and a good, but he's had, had this, this humility, this generosity of spirit, um, which is, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm pleased about the project all the way around, but I think mostly I'm pleased. Um, I'm proud of him as my son for what he's, what he's doing. And, and, it, and it's an a absolute privilege because I'm not a, not wealthy. So I don't have like a lot of, Hey, here's a bunch of money. I don't, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not super technical or something. I don't have like this sort of, I can give you my ability to sort of code or to fix cars or I'm not, you know, there's not a lot, there's, I'm trying to think of the things I'm good at. Like, you know, he knows how to play soccer because, you know, that's, that's, I'm good at that or sports or that kind of thing. And he knows about history and theology. Some of these things I can give, but this is, this is like a, something <clears throat> that, you know, it's a, my, my profession, my vocation uh, and sharing that with him has been a, being allowed to give that to him, uh, you know, take your, take your son to work with you and, and mentor him and give him, uh, walk him through all these kinds of things. It was a, was a, is, was, is, um, a, a real, a massive privilege and a huge answer to prayer. Yeah, that's cool. Cause so often, I mean, you know, young men look at their dads and, well, that's what dad does, but that's not what I do. Yeah. And so to have, uh, to have your son enter into your craft like that and want to, and, that is rich and it's not something you see very often anymore, you know, um, apprenticeship and, you know, a son doing what the father did. And uh, so to see that's really cool. So I'm sure that is, you know, a joy and something that uh, we look forward to. That's cool. Yeah. Sam, we, we like to call this, uh, this podcast, a, a, a digital campfire, you know, the Brad kind of, Brad kind of came up with that term and, you know, that's what we're doing. We're sitting around, we're telling stories. We're we're swapping stories. Uh, if you're sitting around a campfire and everybody's swapping stories, what is your go-to story? And and would you share? Would you like to share that with us? Uh, uh, and it could be from the outdoors. It could be personal. I mean, whatever. Uh, we just we love hearing stories. Uh, maybe the untold story. If that's something, could would you share something with us? Sure. Um... I don't know. For some reason, what pops in my mind is, you know, you kind of heard a little bit of our 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 care for our as a family. Like we love this state and um, care about our heritage and that sort of stuff. Um, we had, had an uncle who who uh, was doing a lot of research. You know, doing this sort of uh, family history, sort of genealogy kind of stuff, mm. and he traced our ancestors back the first ones that came over uh they were scots irish um we, and i found out that you're not supposed to say scotch irish that the scott the scots do not like that apparently so we're supposed to say scots irish now so i didn't know that but i've learned um and so when we were growing up we were always thought we were scotch irish but anyway the, the first people that came over one of them was you're talking about Sam. tape you know, we're talking about tape here yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> Not a drink, not a tape. I don't know what it is, but um, <laughs> Scotch Irish is something you get at a bar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they the they were Presbyterians who came over. One of them was a pastor named Samuel Smith, 
and uh, one of our, our oldest ancestors from the Smiths who came, um, they he had some he had some land and he's buried um, up in Pennsylvania and we we uh, found him. And there was kind of a trip of these many generations kind of going up there, Papa, Dad, uh, my oldest brother, his oldest son. I didn't have any kids at the time, but his um, oldest son, I think, was probably eight years old, something like that at the time. His name's Noah. He, uh, so we went up, everybody went up there and they're visiting, seeing the old house, seeing the old, it's kind of, it's sort of a, you know, a, a, a fascinating connection to our family history. And they eventually go, and my oldest brother's walking with his, with his uh son eight-year-old son they're walking through the, the graveyard and he's kind of like this is this is i've seen grandpa david's funeral or not funeral his uh his headstone and there it's kind of it's been a long time and he's walking through there and he's kind of thinking this is a real teachable moment you know this is uh for us and he says uh you know son all these all these folks you know all these names that you see you know they all they all lived, they, uh, they loved, they, they enjoyed, they feasted, they had sorrows, they lived their lives, and uh, they're not that different from us. And, and he said, now, son, son, someday, someday, we're all, we're all going to end up here. And uh, son looked up at him and said, in Pennsylvania? <laughs> and uh it said for a for a uh for a west virginia loving boy this was devastating to him he was meant you know we're all gonna die someday we're right. all gonna you know, but, but this the, our, this boy that shows you how crazy we are about our state but this kid was just devastated, devastated. Maybe, like we're all gonna end up this is still like terrible theology but that's a little. That's a little story, just to demonstrate how how um, crazy we are about our about our state and how how, <laughs> how, how deep the idolatry goes for us. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love I love West Virginia. I mean, I've, I've driven through there. I've actually been uh, snowshoe West Virginia. We've been snow skiing before. And every time we've got, yeah, I've probably been to snowshoe six times. Well, every time we go up there, now. that's that's not too far away from me. Oh man, that that is some beautiful country. And every time I go by there, I'm like, gosh, I wonder if there's a, I wonder if there's a fish in those little streams that you separate the road from the houses. You know, yeah. uh, you know, that that yeah, was it's beautiful country, man. You have a right to be uh, very proud of where you come from. <laughs> it's pretty down there in the snowshoe area, the Marlinton area. The, the, we live closer to Snowshoe, which is a which is a, another ski resort. Um, but it's but but that's not too far away. It's a, Probably an hour and a half, two hours, maybe away from from us. Very cool. I always, always slow down when we see those streams, don't we, Brian? Yeah, <laughs> my, my, that's my my father in law, who's who's a fly fisherman as well. Uh, is just, I mean, he almost drives off the road. You know, I wonder what, what, what you know, <laughs> like freaks up a little bit or it's down. Or he's always he's monitoring all the time. Absolutely. That's that's great. I saw um a while back, I, I guess a while back, I guess a, a year ago. Speaking of, we 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 talked about Hutchmoot earlier. I saw where you got to hike with with Kevin. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kevin Chandler. Yeah, he's a well, he's a good buddy. What was uh what was that experience like? You have any reflections on on that experience and that hike? It was painful. He was heavy. You know, it's, 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 he's right there, you know, he's right there in your backpack, like a Yoda. And he's just, uh, he's, he's saying things aren't as uh, maybe more enigmatic than, than Yoda. You know, Ke yeah. Kevin's uh, Ke Kevin, uh, Kevin Chandler. Yeah. Look him up. If you haven't looked him up, we carry Kevin. He's a, he's a fantastic fellow. Has he been on your podcast? Uh, uh, we, yeah, we've we've, we've thrown fun. that idea around though. Yeah. yeah it'd be cool to he's connect great. with him. He loves getting outside too, you know. It's part of his whole story, but he's he's an awesome guy. But yeah, he he'll, he'll get in a backpack because um, uh, he's not able to walk, but he usually uses a chair. But to to get places, uh, uh, and he's kind of small too. But he, so he kind of, but it is I, I loved it. That was a privilege. That was right up here, right at Grand, up at Grandview, and really close to my house. And but we walked around, uh, um, hiked around. It was an awesome time. I love I love spending time with Kevin. He's a Talk about an inspiring dude. You know, we we if we're we're 
some of us are people who are like maybe reluctant or it's hard to get us moving or that kind of thing. And, he, and here's a guy that's got every limitation you can imagine. And he's just like, that's not going to stop me. I'm going to go to China and see the wall. I'm going to go to um, these islands in Ireland and all over Europe. And I'm going to go to hillbilly West Virginia and go around. He just, he's an awesome guy. And it makes, it's inspiring to me to think uh, about, about some of the limits that I either put on myself or actually have as, as um, being opportunities for, for uh, growth and adventure. And he uh, love that guy. Well, speaking of uh, negative, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, speaking of adventure, we like to ask our guests, "What's your next adventure?" So you might like to ask that, but do I like to answer it? I mean, I don't. <laughs> that. We don't. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, my next adventure. It's funny, is I, 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 uh, I don't think very often in those terms, which is probably a, a, a bad thing. About it. it's a good question. Um, I'm uh I don't know how much of my I'm a little bit of a homeboy and so I like being home. I'm I'm going on tour pretty soon. I'm doing a book tour, which I think would be considered an adventure to absolutely. Um it feels I like it because I get to meet a lot of the kids and it's 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 fun. I'm also like I also like being home with my family, and that feels like the biggest adventure to me, really. Uh is I love um I don't know, man. I, I'm I'm uh I'm I'm sort of a, a fan of like thinking small, uh, and everybody's like think outside the box, think big, and all. That. And I'm and, I, and that, that's I'm a little bit naturally inclined that way to sort of be a big dreamer and everything. But I, there's some romance to me in thinking inside the box. You know, inside the box is my family and my community, my church, my town, and I I want to be here. This is not a place I want. I need. I feel a need to escape from. I feel like it's a place I want to escape into and I want to show up to. And that's part of what the, the Jack Zulu and the Waylanders key is about. And that's really the, part of the theme of this, of the story. And I think that's, it's, it's really influenced a lot by Chesterton um, in, in uh, orthodoxy and this whole of the, the, the uh, about gratitude and wonder and about receiving where we are. So I feel like my, my biggest adventure is here um, at home and I've got these precious human beings all four of them still in my house right now and i don't that won't be for very long i've got a 19 year old a 17 year old now a 13 year old and a 10 year old and and mm -hmm. i um not that that's my whole life you know i don't that's not that's not the, an idol i want to worship or anything but i it's a it's a these people are are a um stewardship that i want to um receive and 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 do a good job with like even more importantly than sort of becoming you know scaling my business be, you know move which stuff I, I care about i think about i want to do a good job and there's a lot of opportunities that we've had to sort of take next level sort of steps in in whether that's making films or doing this kind of thing and and i um i don't know i don't that's not the goal of life you know that's not the whole thing so i i i I, I, I'm, there's part, there's a big part of me and I hope that I'm not immediately contradicted by my actions in six months or something, but, <laughs> but, but my heart is really in to this adventure and with these people. And I think that I don't want to run away. I don't want to, I don't want to escape the life that I've been given. And I don't want to always be envying or longing for like, if I just had a little bit more or if I just had my neighbor's car or my or someone who lived in a bigger city or someone else's you know I, I just i want to be content and i want to receive so that sounds corny maybe a little bit but uh, but I, I that feels like the biggest adventure for me is is um a modest grateful uh receiving of what i've been given and and a real like sort of um, intentional exploration of like what what I'm actually called to, and um, uh, instead of thinking like how do I leap all these steps like uh, so I can get all the way to the top, like what's the next step, and how and I'm really grateful for being given that next step, and the one after that, 
the one after that because there's big de- you know the 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 I don't know that anybody's gonna I don't know that anybody's gonna remember like it's the the most famous or the most successful people that we know like I don't know how long anybody's gonna care about you know and, and is anybody gonna care about the difference between you know you did this versus you did this like I think what people remember is those are, are is you know what you how much you loved them and how and 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 even beyond memory like how that shapes people um in life what their what their capacity if i love my kids and my wife well as well as i can then what kind of compounding interest will that reap down the line um, so even strategically i kind of think that thinking small thinking modestly is effective <laughs> for what i want to see in the world mm-hmm. and uh, and sort of receiving it from the hand of god leaving the results up to him but but um especially in this first province of my stewardship i just want to i want to i want to live an adventure here uh, even if it's modest I want to, that's where I want to, I want to show up and be present. I love that. That's, uh, that's something similar to, it makes me, it makes me think back to James Whitmer, you know, just finding adventures in your own, uh, you know, in your own backyard, you know, in his garden, there's Mm -hmm. a, there's a lot to be found, you know, in the trails of West Virginia, right next to your home. Yeah. Uh, There's a reoccurring in, in a lot of your photos, there's a reoccurring overlook, um, that I've seen is that? Did you mention that earlier? Is that somewhere close to your home? Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's not too far away. That's Grandview. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Grandview, it is named, a Grandview. Well, well is. named. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it was named by some uh, British soldiers that came here you know, around the time of the Revolution. I think that that's where it came from. I'm not 100 percent sure, but yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's pretty. It's it's not spectacular. It's not uh, which I which I like. We've got we don't have the hard stark forbidding massive mountains that they have out west which i love which are spectacular there these are warm hills and it's a mm-hmm. it's kind of a modest uh beauty that i, I like that, that. I, that i love how can people find your books sam just kind of dig around just look around just like <laughs> see you, do, look just between the back. stones yeah just do your best i'd say just give it a, just give it a shot you know I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, e- I'm easy to find. Uh, SDSmith.com is, is, I think you can find everything. Awesome. Okay. We'll put that in the, uh, in the show notes for this episode. Cool. Man. Yeah. You said something that made me think about a perspective. My, my dad would, uh, would always say is we were, we, if we were building something or working on something, you know, say at our barn or, you know, around the house and, you know, you're measuring something or cutting something or putting something down. It wasn't quite exactly right, you know, but it was close. He'd go, you know, a hundred years from now, nobody's really going to care. Yeah. You know, it's like, it'll be fine. You know? <laughs> and so I, that is such a great perspective, you know, to have is when you're thinking small like that is like, what's really going to matter in a hundred years, mm-hmm. you know, is it, this was perfect. Or we, like you said, we did this thing or we did this huge thing a hundred years from now, who's really going to remember that, you know, and what kind of impact is that going to make? And so, uh, it certainly takes an awful lot of pressure off in a, in a world that's social media driven and we, we curate what we put online and it's always the best thing, you know, it's never usually not the worst thing or the bad days or the average days. It's always like, look at this awesome meal that I just ate, right. <laughs> you know, taking photos of our, our, our food and, and we're curating the best things and it's not really the normal things. And uh, so I appreciate that perspective of, you know, what's really going to matter in a hundred years or, or down the line for our family. So that's, my, my uh, dad would say, uh, nobody will notice from a galloping horse. Like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a version of what your, of what your dad said. Yeah. I like I that. that. I think he got it from his, from on back, but, uh, I like that from a, from a galloping horse. Like if you got a bad haircut or something, ah, <laughs> that's good that's good well uh man we really appreciate you taking time to join us and sharing your heart and sharing your work and your story with us um man i hope uh it certainly impacted me just this conversation alone has impacted me and did you get saved did, did i say did i save you 
Did I just save you? No, yeah. no. Jesus is taking care of that. Thank no. you. Hey, but we might pass he, around the uh, offering plate. You know? He beat you He's to all... it, but we will pass the offering plate. We'll, we'll pass it around the digital. <laughs> Jesus the digital, is always doing better stuff than me. I tell you what. The, the aisles, the buses will wait. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Reverend Smith has brought the message today. Uh, no, it really, uh, really impactful. You know, for us, you, you said something earlier that is uh, is really at the heart of of what Brian and I are about in this podcast is taking the pressure off of yourself as you're, you're serving these, you know, your family and these people. And these are stories that you, you know, you told your kids and now you've, you know, you've printed these stories and other people are benefiting, but the, the, your, your initial goal was, was your family. And we we literally, uh, Sam said those same words as we started this podcast is, you know, this, does it matter? I know. If... I, I copied you guys. I heard you, and I was like, I'm, 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 "This whole thing is a fraud." It's a identity <laughs> yeah, But it's just for for me, it's very encouraging, you know, to hear that and to go. For me, it's reassuring that we're on the we're on the right track. And that's if if we tell our stories, we write some of some of our episodes or essays that we write are stories and reflections on or on our own personal experiences. And if no one ever hears that but my children and brian's children are able to hear he and i share these stories tell these stories have conversations with with people like you and it's digitally there for them to come back to one day when i'm no longer here Mm -hmm. then we've then we've been a success Mm -hmm. and uh that's our hope and that's the goal and um man I'm, i'm encouraged by that truth and i hope to see more people i hope we see more people take the time to go you know what uh, I want to leave, uh, you know, I guess the the big word would be legacy. You know, what am I leaving for my family and my kids? Um, does it have to, you know, to be a New York Times bestseller? Not, not No, it doesn't. But mm-hmm. if it's a treasure for your own family, stories for your own family and your own kids, then, man, what a blessing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would kill to have some of my dad's stories written down, some of my dad's stories recorded to have those to come back to. Um, to be able to come back to and hear recordings of his voice would be, would be incredible, you know? And so for Brian and I, we have, we've been good stewards of that and going to continue to do that. You know, no matter who listens to it, we know we'll always have our, our family will have this treasure. So man, thanks for that reassuring word and your time today uh, to meet with us and to share all of that. Um, we hope all of these things do exactly that encourage people to do the very same thing to share their own stories to to have their own adventures in the place that we love to call the storied outdoors awesome thank you guys